Last time we met, I warned about false conversion and a very sobering text we receive from our Lord Jesus the warning that many will think they're saved, but on Judgment Day will find out that no, they are not, and by then it will be too late, and they'll be cast in the lake of fire. And today, I finish off this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I've been in this, I believe, since mid-April 2018, so just under a year, with a few intermittent breaks. Finish it off with an illustration of what we talked about last time we were together. I was preaching. This text today, verse 24 through 27, is an illustration of what we heard about last time. And here's the point. If you don't do what Jesus says to do, you are not saved. If you do what Jesus says to do, you are saved. You will be ruined and crushed and you will collapse in judgment on the last day if you do not do what Jesus says to do. And you will survive the coming judgment if you do what Jesus says to do. One point of my sermon today, prepare for judgment day. You need to prepare for Judgment Day. One point. Look at the text at verse 24, and we'll read through verse 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell and great was the fall of it. Bow with me for a quick word of prayer. Father in heaven, we, b- we bow before you and we ask for your blessing and anointing upon this time that the application that needs to be made with the word and the preached word would be according to your will and by the leading of your spirit, that the word would come with power, and convict and convert the soul, that those who are lost would cry out for mercy. Those who are saved will be affirmed and built up. May we receive this with joy and cherish our Savior because of it, in whose name we pray, amen. The cross of Jesus Christ, this bloody cross, earned your justification before God. That means is that On the cross, Jesus purchased your righteousness. So you have a righteous standing before God, regardless of your past life and how bad of a lawbreaker you were. You have a righteous standing before God because of the cross, because of his bloody death. But that's not the only thing he did. Those whom he justifies, he also sanctifies. 
And so the power of the cross is such that yes, you are justified by faith in the cross, but if you are truly justified before God, you will have a changed life. The grace of God is so potent that it doesn't stop at justification. It produces the fruit of righteous actions from a heart that longs for righteousness and that's been converted. And so many have been taught half the gospel. So many have been taught half. Have not received the full blessing of God because they've never been taught that salvation is more than justification. It's a changed life. The grace of God is so potent that it changes your very life. And this is what Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. And this is what he's talking about in these warnings. We find that the cross is so powerful that those who come to Jesus by his power submit to him as Lord. Submit to him as Lord. We find that those who enter the kingdom of God are those who obey the king of the kingdom. D.A. Carson commented on our text today, and I want you to pay very close attention. Entrance into the kingdom then does not, or does, sorry, does turn on obedience after all. Entrance into the kingdom then does turn on obedience after all. Not the obedience which earns merit points, but which bows to Jesus' lordship in everything without reservation. If Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And if he's not Lord at all, he's not your Savior. He's not your Lord, he's not your Savior. He's not your Lord, he's not your Savior. And Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Mount, this very powerful sermon that we've been in for almost a year looking at, the sermon that came from the lips of Christ. He concludes it with a very, very vivid illustration that is meant to terrify you into the kingdom of God. It's meant to frighten you it's meant to frighten the unconverted into conversion. This is why he says it. Some people say, well, Jesus doesn't try to scare people with his words. Oh, what's he doing here? Do you know how many warnings we've seen in the Sermon on the Mount? How many times we've told, we've been warned of hellfire? We again and again and again. And he calls out specific sins. And he says, unless you stop doing this, you'll go to hell. Have you noticed that throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has preached conversion, he's warned of hellfire, but he's never said, now just ask Jesus into your heart and it's going to be okay. Never says that. You won't find that in the Bible. He says, stop sinning. Turn. Put an end to it. And and it's very possible, here's why it closes on such a stern warning today, it's very possible that people could sit at the feet of Jesus on the mountainside, hear from the Savior's lips, hear him preach the Sermon on the Mount, this wonderful, beautiful sermon, hear him preach it, and think, my, that's a nice sermon. My, he's a different type of preacher. I've never heard a preacher like that before. My, that was convicting. My, I quite enjoyed that, and still go to hell. That's why he says this. It's possible that you could sit in church and hear me speak the words of Jesus as they're written here and hear me read them and say, my, that was convicting. My, I should probably change. My, that cut to my heart. And still not be saved and still go to hell. This is how serious it is. And this passage today, verse 24 through 27, illustrates the seriousness of the matter. And it's, I want to put it in context because I think a lot of people come to this and 
They think it's something that it's not. And what he's doing in verse 24 through 27, he's providing an illustration of Judgment Day and what it's going to be like. And so let's just wind it up a little bit and read this in context. And here it is, the disciples would have heard it on the mountainside. So you go all the way back up in chapter 7 to verse 12, and what do you have? You have the golden rule. Jesus says, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And in say, stating the golden rule, so what I'm doing is I'm providing a bird's eye picture of the Sermon on the Mount. He summarized the entire Sermon on the Mount. Because he's been preaching the law and applying it to the heart now, verse by verse by verse by verse. And then he gets to the golden rule in verse 12, and he summarizes the entire Sermon on the Mount and says, whatever you wish that others would do, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Whatever you wish they would do to you, do to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And so when the disciples would have heard this, they would have said, my, that's hard. Whatever. And so Jesus quickly shifts gears in verses 13 and 14. He says, yeah, it's hard. Get through the narrow gate and go down the hard road because that's the only way to inherit an eternal life. You're right, it's hard. He doesn't ease up. There's no, there's no release of the pressure. I hope you see that. Some of you are like, Pastor, can you just release the pressure a bit? No, because Christ didn't. And then, and then what he says in verse 15 through 20 is he warns about the people that stand by the narrow gate on the hard road and say, ah, it doesn't have to be too hard. Get, get, get in the big gate. Get in the, get in the wide gate. Go down the easy road. It's, just, it's got to be easy. He warns of the false prophets. Right? And then what he does in verse 21 through 23 is he warns of false conversion, which is the fruit of the ministry of the false prophet. They don't, the false convert doesn't produce the fruit of righteousness. They're lawless characters. There's no love of the law. There's no obedience of the law. There's no cherishing of the law that's written on the human heart. There's none of that in their lives. And so you see how it just, it, he, he brings it right down. He he exposits the law for two and a half chapters. Then he sums the law up with the golden rule. Then he says, yeah, that's pretty hard. Get yourself down that narrow gate and down that hard road. And by the way, don't bother listening to those false prophets who tell you to do otherwise. And make sure you're a true convert. And then we get to today's passage and he sums it all up. He wraps it up all nicely with an illustration. A really vivid illustration. And he takes really earthy languages, language and he just talks about houses. And so if you go to today's passage, you see that this is connected very clearly to what precedes everything I just talked about. Look at verse 24, verse, chapter 7. He says, everyone then who hears. Everyone then. Now the word then is an inference, meaning he's inferring this illustration from everything that's happened. And if you have a New American Standard Bible or a King James Bible, the word then is actually translated therefore, which is also a very accurate translation. And it is connecting this, verse 24 through 27, to what has come before. And what Jesus is doing is he's concluding everything he's just said with a powerful illustration. He's landing the plane of the sermon. He's bringing the ship into harbor. And he says, this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to create a vivid picture in their minds, and I'm going to terrify the wits out of them into, into being converted because if they're not converted, they're going to be destroyed just like this house is that I'm talking about. You say, well, Jesus doesn't preach to terrify people into the kingdom of God out of hell. Well, this is what he's doing here. He's clearly doing it. Just read what he says. And so now zeroing in on today's passage, you look at verse 24 through 25 and what you have is the illustration of the true convert. And then in verse 26 through 27, you have the illustration of the false convert. So you have the true convert in verse 24 through 25, the first half, compared to the false convert in the second half. And what, you can, what you'll notice, and I'm going to do this throughout the sermon, but what I did in my study is I lined up the verses. So I wrote, I wrote verse 24 through 25 out. And then right underneath it, I wrote out verse 26 through 27. And you see that they're almost exactly the same verbatim. Verse 24 through 25, which speaks of the true convert, is 
almost exactly the same verbatim as verse 26 through 27, the false convert. Why is that? Because the true convert and the false convert almost look exactly the same. Almost. I mean, if you met the true convert and you met the false convert and you had a conversation with the true convert and you had a conversation with the false convert, you'd leave the conversation thinking they're both converts. There's no difference. And what we have here, though, is there's a few minor discrepancies in the details that if you just comb them through, stuff starts to pop out of the verse and you realize, ah, that's the difference between the true convert and the false convert. But they're little. Very little. Like, like we're talking words or letters. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to contrast verse 24 through 25 with 26 through 27, and I'm going to bring out these differences in the hopes that you'll hear them and prepare for Judgment Day. Because that's my point. That's what I hope you'll do. Prepare for Judgment Day. And so what's the difference between the true convert and the false convert? Well, if you look at it, let's just pay attention and we'll look at verse 24 and 26 and compare them first. Because remember, verse 24 through 25 is the true convert. Verse 26 through 27 is the false convert. So look at verse 24. And, and you'll see how, how similar they are. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them. Stop there. Verse 26. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them. See, quick. Maybe six letters in your English translations. Everyone who does, or everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, verse 24, the true convert, whereas verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them. The true convert hears and does, the false convert hears and does not. That's the difference. So strikingly similar. I mean, both of them hear the words of Jesus. Both are said to build houses in this passage. One, but one does and one does not do. That's the description. That's, that's, that's the essence of it. One does not do, one does do. And that is what distinguishes the two. That's the only thing that distinguishes the essence of the true and false convert in this passage is one does and one doesn't do the words of Jesus. They both hear, they both build houses, they both weather, they go, go through a storm, and the details of the storm are exactly the same, but one does and one does not do. Now, we're told, Jesus tells us at the end of verse 24, he says, the one who does the words is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And in verse 26, the one who does not do will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the wise man versus the foolish man, that's just a descriptive of the difference. It's a description, but that's not the essence. The essence is the doing and the not doing. And then the rock and the sand, I mean, that's just Ill illustrative. It's an illustration. He's creating a picture in the mind. And so it's, it's just all as it is is descriptive at the end of the day. But the essence, the essence, the essence is the doing versus the not doing. The real difference between the true convert and the false convert is the doing and the not doing. That's the difference. Both hear, but not both do. Only one does. So again, it could be very possible that someone would sit on the Sermon on the Mount, sit on the sermon side or the Mount side and listen to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and, and listen and enjoy the Savior's words and say, oh boy, this guy is quite the teacher. I've never heard anything like this before, but still die and go to hell. And so Jesus wants to make sure that they're without excuse. If they're going to do it, they might as well be without excuse with this passage. And I think it's an urgent plea from the heart of our Lord to make sure you're saved. Make sure. The real difference is the doing. So do what? Do what? Do what? So let's look at this again. Verse 24. 
Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, verse 26, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them. So do what? Not do what? These words of mine. Very emphatic there. These words of mine. What are these words of mine? What is Jesus talking about? These words of mine. Well, you've got to re- remember what this is summarizing. And he's summarizing the entire Sermon on the Mount. So he's just preached this massive Sermon on the Mount. And he said, you've got to do this, 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 you've got to do this. And then at the end of it, he concludes by saying, everyone who hears these words of mine. This is in the context of people who have just heard these words of his. And you notice he doesn't say these words of God. He says these words of mine because he is true God and the true interpreter of God's word because he's the one who gives God's word. Speaking with authority. Everyone who hears these words of mine, these words of mine, what are these words of mine that Jesus is talking about? So you know what I did? As I read that and I thought, wow. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back through the Sermon on the Mount and I'm going to try and underline every commandment in the Sermon on the Mount. Because this is what he's talking about. He's talking about doing of it. Actually taking the Sermon on the Mount and applying it to your life and doing it. And so I did that. I, I underlined it. And let's just do a little bit of review with me over the last 11 and a half months of the Sermon on the Mount, will you? And turn back to chapter 5 and let's just look at a few things. These words of mine, do them. Verse 16 of chapter 5, one of the very first commandments in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light shine before others. Verse 16. Verse 17, here's another one. Do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. Verse 22, Chapter 5, but I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to hell of fire. And then in verse 24, he says, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser. Verse 30 of chapter 5, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Or how about verse 29 of chapter 5? If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. He's talking about lust there. Lust. Looking at a woman lustfully or a man lustfully. You're better off chopping off your hands and cutting out your eyes than going to hell with a body that's intact that's leading you into hellfire. This This is these words. Everyone who does these words of mine. Verse 34 of chapter 5, do not take an oath at all. Verse 37 of chapter 5, speaking of honesty, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. Verse 29, retaliation, do not resist the one who is evil. Verse 41, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Verse 42, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Verse 44, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Verse 5 of chapter 6, you must not be like the hypocrites. Verse 6 of chapter 6, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father in secret. Chapter 6, verse 16, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. Chapter 6, verse 25, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Chapter 6, verse 26, look at the birds of the air. Chapter 6, verse 31, do not be anxious about anything. And here's this very important verse, chapter 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Chapter 7, verse 1, judge not. Chapter 7, verse 6, do not give to dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before swine. Chapter 6, verse 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Chapter 7, verse 12, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Chapter 7, verse 13, enter by the narrow gate. Chapter 7, verse 15, beware of false prophets. And that's what he's saying. You get back down to verse 24 and what do you see? Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. He's summarizing his sermon. Have you taken my words and are you doing them? That's Jesus' point. Are you doing what he's taught you? 
Or are you foolish and you're saying, yeah, I'll listen, but I'm not going to do them. I just like listening. I'm, I'm a spectator. It's fun to listen. It's fun to learn new stuff. And the Bible is kind of interesting. So, yeah, this is in, neat. And it's good to feel conviction every now and then. And Jesus said, no. Not, not, that you, not that you just heard, not that you just felt. Did you do? And this is completely consistent with what the rest of the Bible teaches. Completely. Completely consistent. I'll give you an example. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 to 6. I'll throw it up on the board. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments as a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Or Titus chapter 1, verse 15 through 16. To the pure all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. They deny him by their works. I hope you get the point. So many have been sold a cheap gospel by a false prophet. So many have been told, oh, just ask Jesus into your heart. Magic pill, the evangelical sacrament. Oh, it doesn't matter if Jesus is your Lord. Just make him your Savior. You don't hear that. John MacArthur, Pastor John MacArthur said on this text, commenting on it, he says, to profess knowledge of God and his truth, but not follow God obediently and live his truth is to be deceived. Oh, it's good to go to church and get conviction every now and then. Yeah, but you still go to hell unless you do it. That's the point. And I fear for some of you that your religion is like your sports team. And what I mean is, is you watch the game and you're invested in the team emotionally. It's like you, the next day they win and you're like, oh, I'm having a great day. You talk about it with your buddies, your friends. And it's like, yes, this was, that was a good, exciting thing. And you get excited with your friends. And then if they lose, your heart sinks. And if they score, they, you, know, you rejoice and you get excited. And if, they, and if they get scored on, your heart sinks. But you're not on the team. You're just a spectator that's emotionally invested in the team. And that's how so many people are with church and Christianity. Oh, they get excited, but there's no change. And that's what Christ is going after here. Now, if you find that your heart, listen to me, if you find that your heart is sweetly engaged with the text of Scripture and with communion with God and with obedience, a communion with God, a fellowship with God that results in obedience, this is a wonderful affirmation for you. This is a wonderful affirmation for you because you're like the wise man who built your house on the rock because you receive the Word of God and you do it and you love it and you treasure it and you want to build your life with it. But if you read this, and it doesn't transform into obedience, and I fear that some might even read it and say, oh, I hate it when they say do. But even if you don't hate it when they say do, even if you love it when they say do, but you don't do, terrible, 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 terrible warning for you. Terrible warning. The question is, do you do? You need to prepare for judgment day. You have to prepare for Judgment Day. And this is conversion. Like, conver like you got to understand, conversion is supernatural. It's not something you can manufacture in your heart. It's something, it's a miracle of God that he produces in the human heart so that the heart's affections are now pointed towards God and those new affections towards God become obedience, doing. 
The unconverted heart can say Jesus is Lord really, really loud, but transforming that into actual practice doesn't happen. The difference between the true convert and the false convert is the true convert hears and does, the false convert hears and does not do. But there's another difference too. And that's the future difference. I just talked about the present difference. The present difference is the false convert hears and does not do. The true convert hears and does. That's the present difference right now. The future difference is the true convert lasts forever, but the false convert collapses in judgment under the judgment of God. Collapses, just, just destroyed. Nothing left. You, you can't even recognize him afterwards. He's so mangled. And, and so you look at verse 24, and the true convert builds his house on the rock. We move into this illustration. In verse 26, the false convert builds his ha house on the sand. And, and one of the things about, about building these structures, it's an illustration that God is giving us, that Jesus Christ is giving us, is my guess is because the words are so similar between the true and the false convert, is the houses almost probably look exactly the same. They're probably prefab homes. But they're not, they're not you know, you, like you go down a new subdivision and, oh, that house, is, it's the same one, the same architect, same designer. Yep, that, they're exactly the same. But the difference is what you don't see. You don't see the foundation. You don't see what's underneath. And so we're told that in the, in the Middle East, or in Israel, actually, they have, uh, on the Sea of Galilee, the sand in the summertime, in the dry summer months, gets a dry, crusty surface on it that almost feels like a rock. But if you build a structure on that sand in the summer months, when the rainy season comes, the structure will be washed away because that dry, hard surface on the top of the sand will just... It would be done. There's nothing left. It just wash. It's almost like the snow. Like, you know you have a fresh fall in snow. You have a couple feet of snow, and you get freezing rain on top of it. And if there's enough freezing rain, there's actually a crusty light ice layer on top of it. You could actually stand on it in some cases. But below that ice layer is soft snow. That would be something comparable to our context. And in fact, they... They did some excavations in the 1970s in, in this Galilee area, and what they found is that if you dig 10 feet below the sand, there's a bedrock that homes at that point in time in antiquity were built on. Because in order for that home, that structure to survive the rainy season, they had to dig 10 feet below the sand and somehow fasten it or build it on the bedrock that's down there so that it will survive the rainy season and not be washed away. And this is what Christ is talking. He's taking an illustration from their lives. That's all he's doing. So basic. But the true and the false convert look exactly the same to the naked eye. Exactly the same, but their end is different. And by the way, in verse 24 through 27, when he's talking about these homes and this terrible weather that these homes experience and the end result of the terrible weather, he's not talking about the trials of life primarily. Some of you read this and you're like, he's talking about trials that come. No, this is judgment. This is the wrath of God. Say, so how do you know that? Well, I know that because first of all, verse 24 links this to the rest of the passage with the word in the ESV then or in the other translations therefore, so it's linked to it. It's an inference from what's already come, which is talked about judgment. And further, there's other parts of the Bible like Ezekiel chapter 13 that speak of the judgment of God as a great storm. Point in case, Noah and his ark. And, and actually, if you read, a lot of you, if you get insurance policies on your home, and you read through the insurance policies, you're, you're covered by, from acts of God. What's an act of God? It's a violent, destructive storm. It's God that sends the storm. And, but this is a massive act of God 
that is infinitely worse than any storm that you've ever experienced because this is the final act of God, which is judgment. And let's just look at it because the final storm that the true convert receives is exactly the same as the one, pretty well exactly the same, almost verbatim, with maybe one little word in there different, but are almost exactly the same as the false, as the true convert. True convert and false convert, almost exactly the same as the storm that they weather. So let's just look at the storm that they weather. True convert is verse 24 through 25. False convert is 26 through 27. And look at this storm. Verse 25, and the rain fell. Verse 26, or I'm sorry, verse 27, and the rain fell. Exactly the same. It's not talking about a nice little mist that comes down. It's talking about a violent torrent of rain that causes the ground to swell up and beats against the house. Okay? It was in Mississippi once and not far from the ocean just before hurricane season, and I remember the rain came down so quickly that within minutes the street and the front yard of the house where we were staying looked like a pond. That's how quickly it rose. It was just beat down. Raindrops the size of buckets. That's an exaggeration of what I experienced. But this is the image we're getting. Torrent of rain. And so look at verse 25. And the rain fell and the floods came. Look at verse 27. And the rain fell and the floods came. Exactly the same. And the floods are not just flooding. It's the rapid swelling of a river. The Greek language would, in, would, in, would indicate that. It's the rapid swelling of a Move, fast moving river. And so it's very dangerous for little children to play in rivers this time of year. Why? Because the rivers are moving fast. Our time of year, right now, in the spring, when the rain comes down and the snow up north is melting and it's pouring into the rivers, and the rivers are just like Grand, the Grand River is just moving so fast. And this is the picture of a house that's built on the river bank. And, and the snow up north is melting, and the rain is pounding down, and the river rises just really, really quick, and it is moving by miles an hour and whoosh, right against the house. This is the picture. And so look at verse 25. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew. Look at verse 26, 27. And the rains fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew. This is the pounding of the wind. Beating against this house, shaking it. And so let's look at it again. Verse 25, and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. They beat on it. And then verse 27, and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house. See, the house is taking a pounding. This is the point. The water's rising. The side of the house is being pushed against by the wind. The rain is pounding the top of the house. The river is risen and it's beating against the foundation of the house. This is a terrible beating. So up until now, this is the, the storm has been very similar. So again, I want to point out the similarities between the storms. Verse 25, the storm on the true convert. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. Verse 27, and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house. That's the false convert. But look at the end. The end is the most startling part of the passage because it's the end where you see the most intentional contrast. This is the, the quickest, sharpest contrast between the two. Up until now, it's been like a few words here and there, but the, the end is so stark. Look at verse 25. I want you to see. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Verse 27, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. One describes the rock that the house was built on. The other one describes how great the fall was. Stark contrast, how great was the fall of it. The Greek word for great there is mega. It was a mega fall. And did you notice how Christ finished his sermon? <laughs> did you notice? 
how great was the fall of it. Closed the Bible and walked away. That was it. Talks about the true convert, then he talks about the false convert, and then he talks about the end of the false convert, how great was the fall of it. Sermon over, done. You got to get ready for judgment day. You hear a sermon, you hear this sermon on the mount, you hear this sermon on the mount, and it resonates with you, and, you, and you're like, you know what, this is a lot of you, because I know you, and I see it in your life. I got saved, and I'm really different now. Like, my life is different. Like, I don't want the things I used to want, I don't do the things I used to do, I don't I mean, even what my friends used to want to do with me, like, it just doesn't appeal to me anymore. I know this with a lot of you. I, don't, I just don't crave that stuff. In fact, the stuff that I used to like, I just, it upsets my stomach increasingly. This is a wonderful word of affirmation for you. It's wonderful. Because that says that you've been converted. You've been changed. You're not the person you were, and there's a progressive change in your life, and you look at your life, and you're like, yeah, you know what? I actually kind of am doing the words of Jesus. Like increasing, I mean, there's, a, there's, there's lapses at time, but at the end of the day, like, I want righteousness, and my life is moving forward in obedience to God, and I, I just, I don't smoke that stuff anymore. I don't look at that stuff in the computer anymore. I don't even want it anymore. And that says you've been converted, and what a wonderful word for you. But it did not fall. It had been founded on the rock, and that's your life. How sweet. Just take that and hold on to it. And treasure that word. It's encouraging for your soul. But some of you come and you might even like hearing this stuff, but there's no change. Or some might come and they recoil at it and there's no change. And, and for you, there's nothing but warning and condemnation in this. It's complete collapse for you. Complete collapse. Like complete destruction. Jesus doesn't even talk about the sand at the end of verse 27. He says, it fell and great was the fall of it. End of story. Can't even recognize it. There's no effort in your life to fight sin. There's no victory over sin. There's no taking the narrow way. There's no taking the hard road. And, and you're going to collapse. And I'm begging you to repent and put your faith in Jesus Christ. Because if you don't, the end and the fall of you is going to be great. And that's the last the rest of us, the rest of us will see of you. We'll say, wow, that was a great fall. Done. And there's no private joy for you in obedience to God. There's no love of the truth. There's no panting after the law of God as if it is a wonderful thing for your soul. In fact, you see the righteousness of God and its enemy. Your great collapse is coming. You see, there's two types here. Are you ready for judgment day? This is what I'm asking. There's the one who sees this and is like, yeah, that's me. I remember I'm not who I was. I've changed. And there's the one who hears this stuff and says, this, this is too much for me. I can't handle this. J.C. Ryle says, a religion which costs us nothing and consists in nothing but hearing sermons will always prove at last, to be a useless thing. Always prove at last to be a useless thing. Listen, your religion, if it has not turned your heart, if it has not changed your heart, I don't care if you're 12 years old. If you die tomorrow, you will go to hell. You say, but my mom and dad will protect me. No, they won't. You will be damned to hell, and your mother and father will watch you be thrown into hell. And you will never see them again. You must be converted. I don't care how old you are.
Your, your religion is as useless as a furnace that only works in the summer and an air conditioner that only works in January. That's about how good your religion is. It's worse than that. Because it looks good right now, but when you need it on the day of judgment, it's gone. If you haven't been converted. Look at what Jesus does. I want you to see this. I don't want you to miss this. Verse 24 through 25, he begins with a wonderful, comforting affirmation for those among you who have been converted and see the fruit of righteousness in your life. What a wonderful thing for you. And you take this and treasure it. Oh, I'm so thankful for what God's done. And Jesus ends the entire sermon on a note of terror. He ends the entire sermon on a note of terror. Some of you, you don't do your kids any favors. When you say, oh, it's okay, don't, don't, don't be afraid. You're probably a true convert, little, little girl, little boy. Don't do that to your kids. Let them work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Don't rob them of that. You may soothe an unconverted conscience all the way to hell and you'll stand there on judgment day and you'll watch your little child thrown into hell because you soothed an unconverted conscience and convinced that unconverted conscience that it was converted. Let them work out their salvation with fear and trembling like everyone else has to. What a sweet word for the converted. You don't need to fear judgment. The kingdom of God is yours. You're in the kingdom. It's wonderful. You've been converted. You see how he starts this? It's so good. But then you see how he ends it? He ends his entire sermon on a word of terror. And it fell and great was the fall of it. You might have been baptized even. You might come to church every Sunday. You might say prayers, but if God hasn't converted your heart and you don't bring forth the fruit of righteousness, you'll go to hell. 